Welcome to this course on security analysis and portfolio management. This is being brought to you by IIT Roorkee under the NPTEL program of the government of India. Uh, let us start with the focus areas of this course. The focus areas of this course which I plan to cover uh, is the valuation of bonds and equities and uh, the treatment of interest rate risk. Uh, then I propose to move on to financial derivatives, cover the salient features of financial derivatives and uh, part of the pricing process of financial derivatives because that is quite intriguing. Uh, portfolio management is the third segment of this course in which I propose to cover the mean variance portfolio optimization theory in a lot of detail and then move on to the CAPM, APT and the factor models. So, this is the uh, more or less the structure of this course, uh, the focus areas. Um, the course is very much relevant to the MBA students. In fact, uh, uh, security analysis and portfolio management is a traditional elective that is offered in the uh, finance stream of all uh, business schools for MBA students. Uh, the students of uh, Chartered Financial Analyst CFA program will also find it extremely useful as indeed will be the students of professional courses like Chartered Accountancy, Cost Accountancy and Company Secretaryship. Uh, the students of uh, Commerce and uh, Management uh, undergraduate courses and graduate courses will also find it uh, quite useful. And the course is recognized, uh, it is a standard course and therefore, it attracts widespread recognition in the entire spectrum of financial services industry that includes banks, that includes uh, uh, stock exchanges, commodity exchanges, stock brokers, portfolio managers, investment bankers and market regulators as well. So, the recognition of the course is quite widespread. Uh, now, we come to the recommended text. As far as the uh, security analysis part is concerned, uh, the texts are listed on the screen. Prasanna Chandra's text is very useful, it is very, uh, very well written, very attractive style, uh, investment analysis and portfolio management, it is a McGraw-Hill publication. Prasanna Chandra has another uh, very valuable text that by the name of corporate valuation, which will also be useful in the context of valuation of equity shares. Uh, then we have Riley, Brown and Leeds investment analysis and portfolio management. This is again a standard textbook which covers uh, the, the, um, the content of this course in a lot of detail. But my favorite uh, as far as portfolio management is Elton and Gruber's text. I use it for my uh, teaching at the IIT Roorkee Business School. Uh, it, is, uh, tech, it is titled as Modern Portfolio Theory and Investment Analysis. It is very, very uh, well written in terms of uh, providing a sound mathematical backup to most of the uh, most of the results that we use in portfolio theory that is the usp or the hallmark of this text as uh, the reference text we have pike's book on corporate finance and investment which we shall be occasionally referring to the usp of this course will uh, my target is to bring to the learners a consolidated holistic package uh, of uh, material which will comprise not only of video lectures, video lectures will of course be there, uh, but there will also be uh, exhaustive PPTs and supplementary notes uh, together with the assignment material and the work through problems that will be provided periodically to the students who enroll for this course. So, uh, the attempt is to bring to you a comprehensive package of knowledge in this particular subject. Uh, as far as the structure of this course is concerned, it is a conventional NPTEL pro program of 12 weeks. We will have 30 lecture hours at the rate of 5 lecture, uh, at the rate of 2 and a half lecture hours or 5 lecture sessions per week uh, uh, spread over 12 weeks as I mentioned just now. You will have weekly assignments which you have to work up and uh, submit uh, in the following week and they would form a part of the evaluation process and then you will also have a final exam at the end of this course. 
the tentative course plan uh, that I have in mind at this point in time is to in the first lecture I propose to give an overview of the subject and uh, in, um, and provide a lucid introduction. Uh, in lectures 2 to 6 uh, I plan to start with bond theory that is the medium and long term investments in fixed income securities, uh, discuss the pricing of bonds, discuss the various measures of returns in relation to bond investments. Then I move, plan to move on to interest rate risk and the, uh, the dynamics and the analytics in relation to yield curves. Uh, in lectures 7 to 11, I propose to cover equity valuation, the various models that are used for the valuation of equity that include dividend discounting, that include free cash flow valuations, uh, income based valuations, asset based valuations and relative valuation. I propose to cover each of them uh, in this segment of this course uh, that will relate to equity valuation. Uh, peek into the uh, concepts of fundamental analysis and uh, uh, technical analysis will also be a part of this segment, uh, although detailed notes uh, on these two topics would be circulated to the, uh, to the enrolled students. Uh, derivatives would be covered thereafter in lectures 12 to 22, uh, starting with the, uh, the features of derivative contracts in general and then moving on to specific specifics of forwards, futures, uh, options and uh, swaps and uh, following it up with the valuation and the pricing of forward contracts and uh, options uh, uh, to the extent that we can cover in this, uh, this uh, allotted time. And finally, I propose to move on to portfolio theory, uh, start with the mean variance portfolio optimization model and then develop, uh, and, uh, develop it into the William Sharpe's CAPM and the, uh, the multi-factor models of Pharma and French. So, that is the tentative uh, course structure that I have in mind, the course plan. Uh, so, let us get started. Uh, let us start talking about securities, what we understand by a security. Now, in finance parlance, uh, security is generally uh, termed as a tradable financial instrument. A tradable financial instrument is generally named as a security. However, there is, um, there is an important catch to this and the exact definition of a security would depend on the legal environment prevailing, uh, uh, the su super incumbent environment, su super incumbent legal environment that prevails in that particular area. For example, in India securities are defined in the Securities Contract and Regulations Act of 1956, we will come to it in a minute. But as far as analytics is concerned, a security simply is a point in risk return space. You see, when we talk about uh, analysis of an investment, we are primarily concerned, concerned with two features, the expected return from the security and the risk which is attached to the, to the obtaining of that effect and that uh, expected return. Uh, therefore, it is a two dimensional framework that is normally used for the analysis of investments and we typically refer to this as the risk return framework. Uh, for the purposes of analysis, a security has definitive characteristics in terms of risk and expected returns and therefore constitutes a point in risk return space. That is how we go about analyzing securities in, uh, in this two dimensional framework. Then uh, as I mentioned, uh, the definition of security depends on the legal framework that is uh, prevalent uh, in that particular country, in that particular domain. Uh, for example, as I mentioned just now, we define the, the term securities and uh, section uh, 2H, uh, I think it is section 2 sub uh, clause H of the Securities Contract and Regulation Act 1956 to mean the following shares, scripts, stocks, bonds, debentures, debenture stock or other marketable securities of a like nature in or of any incorporated company or other body corporate. Then 1A clause says derivatives are also part of securities, the derivatives also uh, are uh, encompassed within the definition of securities. Units of investment schemes, uh, units of any other investment uh, instrument issued by 
collective investment scheme to the investors is also uh, comes within the ambit of securities. Uh, units of mutual fund schemes also come within the ambit of securities, government securities like uh, T bills, T bonds and so on and such other instruments as may be declared by the central government to be securities as well as rights or interests in securities. So, this is quite a broad spectrum definition of securities and uh, all the instruments which come within the ambit of this definition would be considered securities as at least as far as the law is concerned. But for our purpose we shall confine ourselves to the rather simplistic definition of a security being a tradable financial instrument. Now, objectives of security analysis. The objectives of security analysis are multifold although the fundamental objective of security analysis is to arrive at an investor centric valuation which is sometimes known as the intrinsic value and uh, it is investor centric and it uh, it enables us to enable the investor to gauge or to place a value to place a worth as per his perception as per his uh, what you call risk return characteristics uh, to a particular security and thereby compare it with the then prevailing market price and take investment decisions whether to get in or out of that particular security. So, that is the bottom line of what security analysis essentially is. We try to uh, ascribe a value to a security on a rational basis, uh, a value that depends on the uh, perceptions and risk return characteristics of the investor and thereby by comparing that particular value with the then prevailing market price, he can identify underpriced or overpriced securities and take investment decisions accordingly. So, that is the bottom line of what security analysis tries to do. Of course, as a, as a, as a side light, uh, the security analysis uh, uh, process also attempts to analyze the effect of various market fluctuations like interest rates, exchange rates and so on on the value of securities. So, that is in a sense what security analysis uh, means and that is what we will be trying to do at least for the first half of this course. Now, classification of securities, well the securities may be broadly classified as equity securities, debt securities, derivatives and finally, hybrids. So, these are four types of securities, this is a very broad classification, but this has a lot of sense attached to it as we shall see uh, very soon. Uh, equity securities, debt securities, hybrids or and then derivatives or you can uh, put derivatives at number 3 and hybrids at number 4. So, what are equity securities? Equity, you see uh, uh, most of us uh, who are uh, taking up this course would be fam familiar with the meaning of equity. Equity in essence means the ownership of the company. So, in a, uh, this implies that if you are holding even one equity share of uh, company say Reliance Industries, you are in part ownership of that particular company. Equity reflects ownership. Okay. So, equity refers to a share in ownership of the company, equity holding generally generates. Now, the returns from equity are comprised of two parts. Uh, one is the distribution of profits uh, by the company to its shareholders, to its owners that is uh, and that part is called dividend. Now, please note uh, uh, that the distribution of dividend is discretionary. I shall talk more about it in uh, some detail uh, at a later point in time, but essentially the distribution of dividend uh, is discretionary whereas, uh, um, when we talk about interest it is not discretionary, it is mandatory, but we will come back to it. So, uh, equity holdings generate income to the investor by way of dividends if the company is profitable, if the company in which you have invested equity shares uh, uh, turns out to be profitable, the, the management, the, the shareholders of the company may decide to distribute a part of the uh, profits or the whole of the profits uh, to the shareholders as uh, uh, owners of the company that part that distribution is termed as dividend. 
Furthermore, uh, if the equity shares are listed on an exchange that is they are tradable on an exchange or stock exchange like we have the national stock exchange in India, we have the Bombay stock exchange, the NSE and the BSE in India. Similarly, there are uh, stock exchanges at which equity shares are traded all over the world. So, if the shares are traded on an equity exchange, then the prices of those shares will fluctuate uh, in, in reference to a multitude of factors that could be economic factors, that could be factors that in fact and that affect the particular industry that we are talking about or th those could be company specific factors also. If a company does very well in a particular year, uh, the, the share price or the stock price could jump up significantly and if a company falls on bad days, the prices could fall. But uh, uh, I would, would like to emphasize at this point that uh, the performance of the company is the not sole factor that is that influences the prices of shares. There are broad spectrum factors like the economy of the nation, the, the GNP, the GDP and so on and the growth rates in these particular parameters. Then we have the and the uh, industry specific factors, the government policies in, re in res respect to or in relation to a particular industry whether certain concessions are allowed or certain additional levies are introduced that may influence the growth, future growth rate of industries uh, or the companies belonging to that particular industry. So, these are all factors which would contribute to influencing the stock price. The net outcome is that uh, once you are invested in a stock, uh, the future price of the stock is, is uncertain and uh, if it increases you are of course getting an income by uh, and you decide to liquidate your investment in the equity you will uh, get what is termed as a capital gain in other words let's take an example if you are invested in an equity share at rupees 1000 and uh, you sell up the share uh, at the end of one month at say 1200 then this 200 constitutes the capital gains for you uh, so the bottom line of what I am trying to say is that the income that arises from an equity investment uh, comprises of two parts. Number one, the, the dividend that is distributed by the company and number two, uh, capital gain or loss as the case may be uh, if the price at which you liquidate the investment is more or less as the case may be uh, compared to the price at which you have taken the shares at, uh, at the price the, at which you have invested in the share. And debt securities, well debt securities have a significantly different uh, characteristic from equity. The fundamental difference is that equity represents ownership, debt represents borrowings. In other words, the, the holder of debt securities has lent money to the company, the company has borrowed and in exchange of that borrowing of money, the company issues certain securities to the lender. This is called debt securities. The, uh, so, debt securities are securities issued under a contract of borrowing of money by the issuer. The issuer has borrowed money and in exchange of that borrowing, it may issue certain securities to the lenders of money, one or more there may be and uh, that lending. Uh, is uh, or that securities that, that are issued um, um, in uh, relation to the lending borrowing agreement is called debt. So, these securities embed a promise naturally when you lent money to to uh, uh, when you have borrowed money from a uh, lender, it is quite natural that you undertake uh, to return the money to the lender together with interest thereon. So, these securities embed a promise of repayment of the amount borrowed and interest for the period of borrowing. Uh, so, when you uh, borrow money against debt securities, against the issue of debt securities, it is understood that you will uh, you will repay the money uh, that you have borrowed together with interest thereon. Bonds, debenture, debentures, commercial papers, treasury bonds, promissory notes, treasury bills, these are examples of securities which are debt securities in their uh, in nature. So, the agreement under which the agreement under which these debt securities are issued is usually called an indenture. Uh, an indenture usually contains the following provisions, uh, details of the borrowing, repayment terms, interest, the rate and computation, the manner in which the interest to be 
uh, the interest is to be computed and compounded whether it is to be compounded half yearly, whether interest is to be paid half yearly or annually as the case may be. All these terms would be forming a part of the indenture, forming a part of the contract of issue of the debt securities. Then other features and covenants that uh, the borrower may be mandated to observe uh, in relation to the uh, to the borrowing that he has taken up uh, against the issue of debt securities. Covenants essentially mean that uh, there are certain restrictions on what the borrower can do which are imposed by the lenders. For example, the lenders may uh, have the right to appoint nominee directors on the board of directors. The lenders may have the right uh, that uh, un the dividends that may be paid on equity or preference shares be paid subject to the approval of the lenders, uh, disposal of a significant part of the undertaking uh, of the borrowers may only be made with the consent of the lenders. So, these are come some traditional covalents that are embodied in the indenture or the loan agreement uh, which is uh, the uh, which is the underlying document of the issue of debt securities. Before we move forward, uh, this issue of debt versus equity needs to be analyzed in greater detail. We need to look at it philosophically as well. We have talked about it in terms of the technicalities so far. Let us look at it on the basis of certain philosophical issues. Uh, as I mentioned, equity implies ownership. Equity takes the substantive business risk. Uh, however, nevertheless, uh, although equity takes the substantive business risk, there is some protection afforded to equity in terms of the concept of limited liability. Uh, what exactly is limited liability? I will come back to it later on in this uh, lecture. Uh, for the moment, it is a sort of protection that is allowed to shareholders uh, who have invested in a limited company, in a company that is limited by shares. So, we will come back to it, uh, but these are some special features of equity. As far as debt is concerned, in the case of debt, now because uh, equity shareholders take the uh, business risk, uh, because they are the owners, they take the business risk. And however, lenders are not the owners of the company. Lenders are, uh, do not own the company, they have simply lent money under a contract of uh, uh, lending and they shall receive back their uh, principal together with interest and their interest in the company is confined to this uh, particular limit. Uh, so, in the case of lenders, uh, they are not really taking the substantive business risk although this statement needs qualification and, and again I will come back to it. They do not take the substantive business risk although the operations of the company may have an influence on their interests. Uh, however, their, uh, their interest or their, uh, their uh, involvement in the company is uh, subject to credit risk. In other words, they are more worried and they should be worried about getting back their interest and the principal that they have lent to the company. So, that is called credit risk. So, they should be worried about getting back their principal and interest amounts. That is credit risk. The risk of default on the part of the borrower. If the borrower uh, uh, commits default in its repayment, this possibility generates a certain amount of uncertainty for the lenders and that is what is called credit risk or default risk. Now, naturally, uh, because the, the interest of the lenders is confined to the amount that they have lent money and because uh, uh, lent money and the interest thereon. Uh, and they have a some a, a preemptive right uh, to be repaid be, uh, or to be paid interest and repaid a, a principal before any payment to equity shareholders. The lending is less risky as far as the lenders are concerned compared to equity shareholders. Remember, equity shareholders are taking the substantive business risk and the risk of lenders is substantively less. Uh, because it is confined to the possibility of default on their lending, which will only occur if the if the uh, equity shareholders or the equity capital is completely wiped off. Wiped off. I'll come back to it with an example. Now, 
Then there is another important point, a very important point which is usually missed out. Uh, as I mentioned just now, the lenders can impose certain covenants on the borrowing company uh, and this in covenants could be part of the indenture, could be part of the loan agreement. Uh, one of the common uh, 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 constituents or provisions that is contained in the loan agreement is to regulate uh, to some extent the activities of the borrower. Uh, this regulation whether it be by nominee directors or some other means like disposal of undertaking or taking of new projects or paying of dividend as the case may be, uh, whatever this case may be, the regulation of these operations uh, creates a, a certain uh, conflict of interest in some cases which leads to suboptimal decision. So, that is one drawback that uh, the uh, borrowers need to face uh, a significant drawback uh, the in, in, in terms of mo monitoring by parties having limited interest in the business uh, which may result to suboptimal decisions. To justify my point, let us look at two examples. This, this, this conflict of interest is essentially known as agency costs. The conflict of interest between the owners of the company and the lenders uh, is sometimes or usually known as agency costs and the corresponding or the costs that are associated with that are termed as agency costs. Let us consider two projects, project A which is a low risk project and project B which is a high risk project. We have two scenarios. Uh, which could arise or which could uh, affect the outcome of the projects. Uh, one is uh, the recession, the economy goes into a recession and the other is the economy goes into a boon state. Uh, the analyst assumes or the analyst believes that the probability of a recession and the probability of, boon, of a boon are equal uh, and the value of the firm, if it, if it takes a project A, if it takes a project A, the value of the firm will be 100 units of money, whatever that unit of money may be, 100 units of money in the event of a recession in the economy and 200 units of money in the event the economy goes to a boon or goes through a boon. Now, let us assume that the company has borrowed 100 units of money as debt and uh, the rest of it is equity. Uh, I will say uh, it has a debt equity ratio of 1 is to 1. So, 100 units of money is borrowed and 100 units of money is financed as equity to make the capital of the firm as 200. Now, if the firm's value is 100, then naturally because of the preemptive right of the lenders, uh, they would be paid out the entire amount and the amount that would remain for the equity shareholders would be 0. In other words, the bond value would remain at 100 uh, because they will be repaid the entire amount because the company has sufficient manner, uh, sufficient funds to, to manage or to repay the interests of the lenders and therefore, it will repay the entire interest of the lenders. Uh, the stock value will remain at 0. Uh, if there is a boon and the firm's value is 200, then what happens? Then the the bondholders will get their amount of 100, they will be repaid the entire amount. Of course, uh, we assume that the interest is part of this 100 uh, for simplicity and uh, the remaining 100 will be available to the equity shareholders. So, in that case, the value of the equity shareholding would be 100 and the value of the bondholders would also be 100. If we work out the expected value, then the firm's expected value turns out to be 150, the stock's expected value turns out to be 50 and the bond's value turns out to be 100. In other words, the expected value of the bond is equal to what they would normally have received. So, they are not at a loss under project A. However, the equity shareholders have a value of only 50. Now, we look at project B. Uh, project B is a high risk project. Uh, again, uh, the, the economy can either go into a recession with a probability of 0 0.50 or the economy could go into a boon with again a probability of 0 0.50. If the firm goes into a recession under this project, under the project B, the firm's value turns out to be 50 and 
if the firm goes uh, if the economy goes into a boon then the firm's value turns out to be 240 what are the implications for the bond holders and the equity holders let us uh, investigate this point now now as far as the stock value is concerned if the firm value is 50, naturally the entire 50 amount will go to the bondholders and the stock uh, stockholders will get nothing at all. Even the bondholders are suffering in this case because they against their claims of 100, they are getting only 50, but there is no choice because the money has assets worth only 50. And here the issue of limited liability creeps up, we will talk about it. Uh, if the, uh, if the firm's value uh, turns out to be 140, uh, 240, I am sorry, if the firm's value turns out to be 240, the firm goes in, and the economy goes into a boon and the firm's value turns out to be 240, then the bondholders will naturally get their full amount of 100 and the equity shareholders get their amount of 140. Now, if we look at the expected values, they make very interesting reading. The expected value in the case of uh, 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 in the case of the firm or the value of the firm is 145 the stock value here is 70 and the bond value turns out to be 75 now just let just to recall what are the corresponding figures of project a uh, in the case of project a the firm's value was 150 the stock value was 50 the bond value was 100 now, from the perspective of equity shareholders naturally, because the expected, if this expected value for stock is going to be the deciding criterion, then naturally the equity shareholders or the owners of the company would advocate on the project B, because the expected value under the project B for equity shareholders turns out to be 70 compared to 50 for project A. However, from the perspective of lenders, if you look at the perspective of lenders, the expected value of the bond holders uh, in project A turns out to be 100, which has gone down to 75 if the high risk project B is undertaken. So, here is a conflict of interest, here is the issue of agency costs which arises when uh, companies borrow debt. Uh, and the debt is monitored as is usually the case, the debt is monitor, monitored by the lenders. The, the important uh, takeaway here is that uh, debt uh, lending, if the debt lending involves uh, creation of encumbrances, creation of covenants as part of the um, loan agreement, then we could end up in situations where the lenders and the owners of the company uh, have conflicts of interest and that could lead to suboptimal decisions in the uh, in the future prospects of the company we shall continue from here after the break thank you